I'm going to start from the beginning. Hi, again. Uh, I'm Anna Hurlihy. Um, still here to talk about Python and LLVM. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what specific requirements are we needed to meet in order to make this project successful. I'm going to go through the features of Pi LLVM itself. So this is the heart of the talk. And for, once again, for those of you who've taken a compilers course recently, I'm sorry if I am telling you something that you already know. And then I'm going to talk about some related work, uh, mostly Numba, which is another project involving Python and LLVM. I'm going to do some benchmarking and analysis, and then we'll be finished. So how did I get involved in this project? Well, Tupleware is a distributed analytical platform that was built at Brown University. The idea is if you want to run analysis on large data, you need to provide three things. So you need to provide the data itself, obviously. But then you also would provide a UDF, which stands for User Defined Function. This is the algorithm that is going to be applied directly to your data. So for example, k-means or any, of the, any other sort of machine learning algorithm would be ideal for this use. Next step is you need a workflow, which means map, reduce, combine, et cetera. The way that Tupleware works is it takes the control flow and the UDFs and compiles and automatically deploys them on your distributed cluster. So there are a lot of distributed analytical platforms out there like Hadoop and Spark, et cetera. I'm not going to go into the implementation details or the design decisions behind Tupleware because that's not what this talk is about. That is an entirely different talk. I'm going to specifically focus on one of the major goals of Tupleware, which is to be both language and platform independent. This means that you should be able to interface with Tupleware in any language you want. You can use Python, C++, anything. Also, you're not limited in what type of machines you're running on your cluster. You should be able to choose whatever CPU your heart desires within reason. So how do we achieve both uh, language and platform independence? Well, this is where LLVM IR comes in. So LLVM is a lot of things, but it is mostly a series of compiler and tool chain technologies. So the idea behind LLVM IR, which is what we're going to focus on, is that it is an intermediate representation. So intermediate representations are basically halfway between languages and machine-dependent assembly code. So as you can see in my diagram, the LLVM logo is a dragon, which is awesome. And all the logos on the top are different languages. Um, so usually I would go into YPython as opposed to Julia or R or any of the other languages that are good for analysis. But given the location, I'm going to assume that we're all like properly indoctrinated and we all love Python. Um, yeah, what's up? That is Go. That's the gopher. Um, so the way that Tupleware achieves uh, language and platform independence by using LLVM IR is the UDFs themselves are compiled into uh, LLVM IR, and then in a separate step, they are deployed onto their clusters, which means that you can write your UDFs in ideally any language, have them compiled down, which will sort of basically take away the uh, quirks of each language, so it will all run within the same, like, reasonably fast. So the goal of my role in this project is to provide a comprehensive Python front end for Tupleware. So Tupleware is written in C++, and currently, or at least when I started this project, the only way the user could interface with Tupleware was by calling it the operators directly in C++. So this was mostly intended to make it more accessible to the user and reach people who would potentially not want to do their analysis in C++, which I think is reasonable. So how does a Python front end fit into the Tupleware architecture? Well, the two blue boxes on the right are um, the two things that the user supplies. So you need a workflow and you need a UDF. The yellow boxes are the part that I worked on. And then the one in pink is Tupleware itself. So the first of the three boxes are how we are able to call the Tupleware operators from Python. Since we were using Boost in a lot of different parts of Tupleware, it was very easy to just hook it up directly to Python. So Boost Python allows you basically to call your C++ backend directly. The middle box is Pi LLVM. This is where the bulk of the work was. This is where I spent the majority of my time. But because Pi LLVM is a work in progress, we didn't want to limit our user to the features that we had implemented, so we provided a backup method using the Python C API 
so that you could call your UD, you could make executables out of your UDF and call them directly. So this is an example usage for tupleware. Don't worry too much about the implementation of linear regression. It's basically just a standard algorithm that we would expect a user to write for um, tupleware. But the box in red is how the user would interface with tupleware itself. First you load your data, then you define a workflow, which in this case is very simple. It's just map. And then you call execute to get the whole thing running. So if you wanted to take a closer look at the tupleware library itself in Python, you can see that it's very simple. The first thing you need to do when you call map is try to compile your UDF using pi LLVM. If you succeed in that, it's very easy. You can just pass the LLVM IR, which was returned as a string, straight to the backend operators, which is the last line. If you accept an error that indicates that it's because we haven't implemented something, then we use our backup method. Otherwise, we know that the user has written invalid Python. So this is very easy. The hard part is actually getting the UDF into LLVM IR. So Pi LLVM itself is a simple, easy to extend, one pass static compiler. So about five years ago or so, um, some engineers wrote Pi 2 LLVM which was basically an unfinished proof of concept that you could get Python code into LLVM IR using Python and using the existing Python tools for compiler and AST generation as well as LLVM Pi, which is basically a Python wrapper around the C++ LLVM IR module, um, the builder module, which actually generates the code. So it's actually kind of interesting for me because when I first started this project, I like scoured the web to see if anyone else had done something with this, and I couldn't find anything, but I did it a couple of days ago before giving this talk. And there are definitely GitHub repos out there where people took this like a totally different direction than I did. So it's really interesting for me to see. So because this is a really ambitious project and it could very easily spiral out of control, we need to be able to pin down exactly what we need out of our Python subset. So we are anticipating that users will run machine learning algorithms on tupleware. But the nature of machine learning algorithms is that they tend to be simple mathematical expressions that are easily optimized. So there's not a whole lot of fancy Pythonic functionality that we need out of our um, algorithms, although decorators and objects would be nice, but we don't anticipate they're, very, they're gonna be used very often. So we chose to first focus on statically typed, um, static type and verbal code. So this is an overview of the design. Um, for the compiler experts out there, there is nothing out of the ordinary. Um, but in order to compile code, you need to take a couple steps. The first one is parsing and generating an AST, which stands for abstract syntax tree. This, luckily, is handled by Python's compiler package. The next step, oh, also any sort of syntactic errors would be caught in this um, step. Next up is semantic analysis and code generation which are handled by the code gen LLVM visitor class. So I'm not gonna talk about how the visitor class works, but the basic idea is that it traverses the tree and calls a different function for every one of the nodes. And then code generation itself is handled by L, uh, LLVM Pi. So something really important to note about LLVM IR is that it's SSA, which stands for static single assignment. This basically means that like a lot of other intermediate representations, Registers can only be assigned to once before they are frozen. So if we were to implement our compiler with a one-to-one -one correspondence between registers and variables, we'd basically be forcing our user to write their Python in SSA. And that's not totally reasonable. So we need a solution. The way that we get around this issue is by introducing a level of abstraction. So variables are allocated on the stack, and we store the addresses of the variables in the registers themselves. So in order to keep track of a given variable at a given time, we need a symbol class, which basically contains the type, the variable name, the memory location, and some other metadata. To keep track of our symbols, we need a scope. Scopes are basically mappings of variable names to symbols. We keep track of our scopes using a symbol table, which is a stack that you can push and pop stacks off. You can push and pop scopes off of when you exit and enter scope. So it's pretty easy to implement. This is also written before I started contributing. Um, but this also indicates that the lookup time for a given variable is limited by how many, how many scopes you are currently in. 
So now I'm going to talk about the various LLVM types and how we were able to get Python types into their corresponding LLVM representations. So Py LLVM provides a bunch of different types, currently integers, floats, vectors, lists, strings, and functions. But the IR types are all slightly different. Um, IR provides numerical types and then five derived types. So pointers, arrays, vectors, structs, and functions. Um, we can basically create all of Python using these tools, although it does get exponentially more complicated the more functionality you add. And a major goal of this project was to just keep it simple. So because Python is a dynamically typed language and LLVM IR is not, it means that we need to be able to anticipate the type of an expression before we evaluate it. The way we do this is through the type inference node, uh, which basically, given a, a Python expression, will traverse the AST until it reaches a leaf. When you are at a leaf, it's very easy to know what type you have because it's either a basic type like strings, integers, etc., or it's a variable. And then we can use our simple table to look up the type of the variable. The intrinsic math functions sort of overload the numerical types, so you don't have to have different functions for integers and floats. So for example, if you were to call square root on 4.0, the answer would be 2.0, but if you call it on 4, the response is 2. So for numerical values, we represent integers and floats with the LLVM 32-bit equivalents, and booleans are one bit, although we can treat booleans basically as aliases for integers like you can in most cases in Python. Next up is vectors. So because LLVM IR provides a vector type, we can just base our vectors on the LLVM vector type. Um, L, we provide four element immutable floating point vector types, which come up time and time again in mathematical expressions and machine learning algorithms. So this was implemented before I started working and had a big part in why we chose to build our project off of this existing project, since this is something that is gonna be incredibly useful and um, they have, since they have built-in operators, we don't have to worry about doing that work ourselves. Next up is lists. So lists are based on the LLVM array type. They are static length currently, which means that you cannot dynamically resize them, although that is definitely partially implemented in a branch somewhere. Um, at some point, it will get merged in. Um, but for now, we have static length, and since um, Pointers in LLVM contain information about the length of an array. Having arrays of pointers to different uh, size arrays is, not, is also not yet implemented. So we have a little bit of work before we can have static, uh, dynamically linked multidimensional arrays. But um, some other, another quirk with, with lists in PI LLVM is that all variables are allocated on the stack which means that when you initialize a list, the elements of the list are on the stack, so if you want to return it, it will immediately go out of scope. So a temporary solution for this is to allocate it on the heap before returning. This is the only time anything is ever allocated on the heap. So next up is strings. Um, strings we basically got for free, since strings are a list of characters. Characters can be represented as integers, very easy. The only way, um, to distinguish them is through the simple table and having it indicate what, if, whether or not it's a string or an integer. Next up is functions. So the user should be able to define and run functions anywhere within the UDF. We don't anticipate that this is an especially common requirement, but we do want to provide the functionality. So unfortunately, Python functions don't indicate what type they're returning in advance. That would be really nice. Instead, we have to anticipate once again. This is the only place where the compiler does two passes. So first, it needs to do a pass to generate the function signature, and then it has to do another pass in order to actually generate the function itself. Arguments are handled in the same way, but unfortunately, because of time constraints, we weren't able to fully infer the types of arguments. This is sort of an issue that's going to come up time and time again when you're trying to wrestle a dynamically typed language into a statically typed representation. So the temporary stopgap uh, solution is to give every parameter a default value that is of the type that it is expected. This is the only place where the Python that is expected by this compiler 
differs from the Python you would write normally, uh, which is unfortunate, but it is definitely on the list of things to do in the future. So for the intrinsic functions, uh, LLVMPy provides a very simple mathematical library of functions that are likely to be used in machine learning algorithms. So unfortunately, LLVMPy does not provide access to these instructions directly. So LLVMIR does have a square root function instruction, but you can't call it directly using the builder. A workaround for this is basically to write a wrapper function that you can call. You define it in the header so that when you need to call square root, you can call that, and then the linking happens later. So print is handled in the same way. Um, I have to say that when I finally got print working, it was probably my favorite moment of coding, period. Uh, because I had already spent so much time on this project, and since it was developed independently from Tupleware, it meant that I could run my executables, but I had no idea if it was doing what I expected. I basically read the IR to make sure it made sense. Um, so when my mystery executables started printing stuff to standard out, and like stuff that indicated that it was actually doing what I wanted it to do, it felt very good. So lastly, I'm going to talk about branching and loops. So uh, LLVMIR provides compare and jump operations and relatively easy ways to indicate code blocks, which means that these were pretty easy to do. Um, there are some interesting quirks involving LLVMIR, which I encourage you to just take a look at the Wikipedia page. Um, but they are very complicated, and I'm not going to go into them now. But part of the, um, they cause a couple inconsistencies when it comes to branching. So if you declare a variable within an if statement, it will go out of scope upon exit. Also, you cannot return in parts of it, uh, branching, but not other parts. So you can either return in your if and your else, or neither. You can't do either one. Cool, so I'm going to talk about related work now. So the most obvious comparison is with Numba. So Numba is a specializing just-in-time compiler from Continuum Analytics. The purpose of this compiler is basically to run Python code equally as fast as C. This is different from the goal of PyLVM, and you can tell in a couple implementation decisions. So there's a bunch of different uh, things that PyLVM can do that Numba can't, and vice versa. There's definitely more things that PyLVM can't do, uh, but the basic the bottom line in the comparison is that Numba is much more mature and comprehensive, although it is much more complicated. So PyLVM is about 1,500 lines of code. Um, probably should refactor that into different files, but for now it's in one. Um, but the idea is that Numba has different goals, so they don't, it, it's not necessarily, um, it doesn't necessarily apply to the Tupperware usage because primarily Numba is lazy. And the way that Tupleware compiles the functions is they don't need to call it. They, need, they just need to generate IR itself. They need, uh, since Tupleware expects unoptimized LLVM IR to be passed into the back end. Um, the primary benefit of Pi LLVM over Numba for our purposes was it's built in-house, which means that we can specifically tailor the needs, um, the features to our needs, and also because I needed something to do, and I wanted, I've always wanted to write a compiler to LLVM. So that's a big plus. Um, <laughs> second, the next thing I'm going to talk about is analysis. So we chose to look at two different components. Uh, first, we wanted to make sure that our Python front end wasn't limiting the user more than the existing C++ front end. And then secondly, we wanted to make sure that our code wasn't exponentially slower. So I chose a set of sample algorithms. These are standard, short, typical algorithms that you would run on Tupperware. So for usability, um, you don't have to worry too much between the Python and C++ implementation, except for they look almost identical. Um, the difference there, this is actually a benefit to us, because it, as expected, with mathematical algorithms in code, they tend to be sort of same across the board. But working in Python does free the user from worrying about memory management, pointers going out of scope, all sorts of things. So next up for benchmarking, we compared Numba and L, um, Pi LVM. And it's very hard to compare the two projects. It's sort of like apples and oranges, because in order to get Numba to compile something, we had to generate 
uh, code to run it on, and that's not how Tupperware would do it. Additionally, PyLVM is not very fast at generating data. Um, but the bottom line is that compiling the UDF happens once. And compared to the cost of analyzing the control flow, deploying to clusters, et cetera, it's very minimal. We basically just want to make sure that it's not like an order of magnitude slower. But if it's about two or three times slower, which it is, uh, it's not a huge deal. Next up is, so we ran analysis comparing PyLVM and Numba, but I didn't include it in these slides because it would require as much explaining for why it doesn't make sense as the stuff that we get from it, but we basically know that we're not so much slower, it would cause problems. So comparing the actually generated LVM, we got unoptimized LVM IR from Clang that was compiled down from a C++ function. And we compared it to the LLVM IR that was generated using PyLVM. We used LLI to run them and system time to compare. So these are the results. Um, as you can see across the board, PyLVM is slightly slower. That's the blue bars, which are slightly higher because they take more time. The, um, what's interesting here is that while we're slower, we are not that slower, um, so given that Clang is a very mature tool um, that it runs a whole lot faster. So Naive Bayes is about 1% slower. K-means is 12. Linear and logical regression is 9. And explanation for why k-means is that much slower um, than the other algorithms is because k-means has a distance calculation, which means that it uses square root. And because we can't call the instruction directly, we need to have one level of indirection. So we're calling two functions for every time that clang will call one, which obviously slows down the functionality. So overall, uh, we determined that we were successful in providing a Python front end to Tupleware. PyLVM is definitely a work in progress. There is a lot of stuff still to be implemented. Um, but we did sort of walk the line between keeping our code relatively simple and easy to understand while still providing functionality that we would anticipate the Tupleware user to need. Cool, so I want to thank uh, Tim Kraska, who is the um, my advisor, and then to Alex, Andrew, and Kaihan, who are the people who work on Tupleware itself, among others. Also to the people who wrote Pi2 LVM, I hope you don't mind that I lobotomized your code. Uh, also to Pi Gotham for being so uh, great just about everything. Cool. Um, also, I should note that this is something that I worked on about a year ago. Uh, while I was an undergraduate. Right now, I work at MongoDB, and I don't actively work on this code. I do a lot of other systems programming, and MongoDB is great, so if you guys want to apply, I would encourage it. Cool. I don't think I have time for questions. Is that our... No questions? Uh, when are we... When am I forfeiting my stage? Yeah, I think it's about right. Okay, well, I'll be out in the hallway if anybody does want to ask me questions. Also, just ping me online.